Well, hello, Barbara. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Well, thank you, Liz. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very honored that you invited me. Yeah. I mean, when I saw that you were coming out with this book, realizing that it had been a long time coming since your infamous journey across the United States, um, can you talk to us about the moment or the mo series of moments where you decided it was important to share your side of the story and bring it to the page? Yes, it's been quite a journey. Uh, back in 2016, I was in Telluride, Colorado with a group of my son's friends. And among that group, there were some uh, very famous actors. And we were ta talking about, I don't know, about this uh, great epic journey walking across America. And they said, Barbara, you need to write your story from your voice and your point of view. And it'd make a great movie. And of course, I'm thinking, well, that's nice. Thank you. And that's probably, I mean, it's just conversation, you know, in that group. So another five years passed. And my granddaughter, she was about seven, at seven or eight at the time. And she said, Yo-Yo, my name is Yo-Yo. She said, Yo-Yo, did you really walk across America? And all of a sudden the light bulbs went on and I knew that not only for my own legacy, but for a larger audience, I needed to tell my story because the things I learned, the insights, the revelations, the secrets of life, I guess, um, were much greater than me. And I needed to share those and tell my story before, you know, before it was lost forever. And, and I took it to the grave with me. I mean, I plan to live a long time, but still yet. Um, I just, I knew the time had come that I needed to do it. So I, I was coming out of 40 years of silence. I was busy uh, raising children. I was a single mother. I was building a company. I was um, had many ups and downs. Well, once I started writing, it took me three years to write it. So this has been a long time coming. But I will tell you that um, the endorsements, more than me talking about the book, the people who have read it say the same thing. It's 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 a common uh uh, it's a common statement or feedback is I could not put it down. Mm. I've had great, wonderful endorsements from people like Hilary Swank. She's an Academy Award winning movie star who uh, was in Million Dollar Baby. Connie Britton, who starred in the ABC series called Nashville. Um Bridget Connolly, she runs a, or she's the CEO and founder of a, of a nationwide beverage company called Luna Bay. Uh, and then a fabulous endorsement from none other than the queen of country, Dolly Parton. And Dolly read the book. She's an avid reader. And, but she doesn't really, it's not her habit to endorse books. No. But, um. Uh, one of my very best friends is has been Dolly's backup singer for over 30 years. Mm. So Jennifer was able to get this book, the manuscript, into Dolly's hands. Wow. And so Dolly read it and she said, um, well, she gave a, a wonderful long endorsement, but she basically said, I hope this inspires you as much as it did me. And she said, congratulations, Barbara creatively and respectively yours wow. Dolly Parton well you know I kind of dropped to my knees and thought <laughs> this doesn't come along every day thank you God so uh, but that's sort of the backstory of of why I wrote it and now that it's behind me and it's published I'm very thankful that I did yeah I mean, I, I have authors on the show all the time and they talk about the stamina 
that's required to bring a book from an idea to publication. It, most people don't realize how tough you really have to be, not only for the initial draft, but all of the rewrites that come after that. Do you think your walk across America all those years ago prepared you for what was required to bring this book to the world? Well, honey, my whole life has prepared me to endure. I was raised in hillbilly in the Ozarks of Missouri. We didn't have an indoor toilet till I was 12 years old. And I slept in a little lean-to room on a rollaway bed. The, the roof leaked and I water dripped down the, the walls. So I grew up poor. I walked across America. That was three years and 3,000 miles. So part of some of the secrets of life are really learning to endure and to take it one step at a time. So writing a book, this is not my first book. I co-authored A Walk Across America, The Walk West, The Road Unseen. So writing was a part of uh, my background and I always loved to write. But once um, I was in this long season of raising children, and basically trying to survive and build a business, there was no time to write. Mm -hmm. So once I began, once the time was right, and I began to write, yes, it took three years, a lot of perseverance, a lot of stamina, because, um, well, there are different kinds of writers. There are very informational and didactic and uh, kind of collegiate writers, but then there are creative writers people who write novels. Well, this, I'm a creative writer, but I had all the stories and all the fodder to write it. It was just a matter of doing it. Mm. And that, that process took three years. It's uh -huh. a, it's a lot of twists and turns, a lot of high adventure. Wow. I mean, can you talk about some of the the stories that you include in the book, ones that you knew you had to have in there, ones that you wish you could have fit in, but there were just too many. But what what are some ones that you really are happy that you shared? Well, there are so many stories, but the and the adventure was so great. But I mean, I trapped alligators in the swamps of Louisiana. I suffered heat stroke in the deserts of Colorado. Um, uh, we experienced a tornado. I was... Um, I was, uh, I fell off a 13,000 foot peak in ice glacier almost to my death. I was hit by a car in Salt Lake City. I'll tell you one story and your readers will love this because at the heart of everything, I'm just a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I grew up, like I said, in the Ozarks of Missouri. And what we did, people would sit around on their porches and tell stories. There was no internet, no television. We were lucky to have a telephone. And I mean, people would laugh and tell these funny stories of things they did back in back in the old days and in the country. Well, this is a story from The Walk. And this was, we were crossing Oregon and it was the coldest winter since 1919. And I had just learned that I was pregnant with my first child. We had 400 miles left to walk. And I was one of those uh, young pregnant mothers who got sick. And, oh, I was sick as a dog, nauseous, throwing up. And yet I was facing walking across the Cascades in the coldest winter since 1919. Well, we happened to meet an old uh, preacher man. His name was Milo Frankie. And he looked like something out of a Western movie. He had big gray lamb chop sideburns. He had icy blue eyes. He wore a big black hat, a long black coat. He, he sort of had the presence of a Johnny Cash, but yet he was real. And he had spent his life as a... Um, kind of as an itinerant preacher, he would ride horses and go up into the mountains and preach to the loggers and the miners. And he'd go to the saloons and sit next to the men sitting over their whiskey and 
and and talk to them. He knew the demons they were fighting and he knew how to fight them. So my love, Frankie, he said, you will surely perish if you walk across those mountains without help. You must have help. Well, he got permission. He was he was a pastor of a little church there in John Day, Oregon. And he got his congregation to give him permission. And he took off one week and followed along beside us, beside me, in his little old, I think it was a Ford Falcon. It was just some simple little car, but it had a tape deck in it. Mm -hmm. And he had plugged in these old gospel tapes, turn them up as loud as they could go, roll down his window so the heat would blow out on me as I was walking mm -hmm. alongside. I walked at two miles an hour. He drove at two miles an hour. And so he had plugged in one of those gospel tapes and I, you know, the Bee Gees were popular at that time and I would have preferred the Bee Gees, but <laughs> I was thankful for any, any kind of music, anything to distract me from the cold and the nauseous, the nausea. So we moved along. My head was down. It, there were blizzards and whiteouts, but one step at a time. Well, one day or one moment, Milo stopped the car. He got out and he rolled in the snow and he said, oh, look at me, look at me. And he, he was doing anything to encourage me and keep me laughing. And he'd make angels in the snow and I would laugh. And I knew his antics were working because he was encouraging me to keep walking. And then at one point he hollered at me out the window and he said, come on, Barbara, baby. You walk, girl, and I'll throw up. <laughs> so he kept me. I said, I don't know anybody else who has an old mountain preacher as a guardian angel mm -hmm. who got them across those mountains. And he certainly saved my life and got me to the other side. So that's one of many adventure stories in this book. Wow. I got chills when you were saying that. That's incredible. So did you feel like you were protected and guided on this journey? I mean, something like that, such by chance that he came into your life and he really pulled you through. I mean, were there other moments where you were getting nods from something greater than yourself? Yes, there were nods all along the way. Let me tell you the big nod I got to even start this journey. I was working on a master's degree at a seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana. That's when I met uh, Peter Jenkins. He had walked from New York to New Orleans. We met, fell in love, but then he wanted me to join him and walk from New Orleans to Oregon. Well, how's that for a proposal? I don't <laughs> think so. So I was overwhelmed I didn't, I mean, we had feelings for each other and, and romance and all that. But I mean, I, I, I just needed something greater than myself to help me make that kind of a decision. I said, I will go to church with you one last time. And if I don't get some kind of message or something, then you go on, finish your walk and I'll finish my master's. And if we still feel this way on the other side of this, then we'll pick up where we left off. Well, you know, I knew it was going to hurt either way, whatever happened. But I just needed some, some sign, something to help me make this major decision. I was 27 years old. Well, we went to church one last time. The place was packed. It was called Word of Faith Temple in New Orleans. And people uh, were, were getting ready for the service. The place was packed. There was no place to sit except on the front row. Well, Peter looked like a vagabond. He had holes in his tennis shoes and holes in his jeans. And, you know, it would have been better in my mind if we'd sat on the back row and not become a spectacle but no we had to walk through all those hundreds of people to the front row 
So we were right on the front row. Well, the service started. Out comes the main uh, minister. His name was Charles Green. He says, we have a guest minister here today. And I thought, oh, well, good. This will be over quick and I can get out of here. And I guess, you know, this is the end for Peter and me. So he wheeled out uh, an old 80-year-old woman in a wheelchair. Her name was Mom Beale. Well, where I come from in the Ozarks, women were not creatures. Mm. But she came out. They put the microphone in front of her and everybody, she said, well, we're going to read about the story of Abraham and Sarah. Everybody back in those days, people didn't have phones to look up uh, scriptures or anything else. You could hear the swoosh, of the pages of mm -hmm. people. Everybody carried a Bible to church. Well, anyway, she began to read the, these verses and she said, now the title of my sermon today, oh, there was a hush all across the congregation, thousands of people. Peter and I are sitting on the front row. I can see every wrinkle in her face. Mm -hmm. She said, the title of my sermon today is, will you go with this man? I see your reaction. That's <laughs> It was like the finger of God touched me and I had, I had the freedom of choice. Will you go with this man? But it felt like a call. It felt like a mission. And that was the reason, the beginning reason of why, I mean, that was the guidance I needed. And that, yeah. that helped me make the decision to marry Peter and walk from New Orleans all the way to Oregon. So back to your original question. Yes, I felt there was there was protection, although I was hit by a car, nearly struck by lightning more than once, lived through tornadoes. Uh, I mean, there were there were great dangers and great adventures, but I was spared and saved from each one. Wow. Did you ever want to go home? Like leave? Oh. All the time, <laughs> all the time. Oh, it was, I was carrying 35 pounds on my back. For you young mothers out there, if you're toting around a toddler all day long, think about carrying that baby on your back for 15 or 20 miles a day. And then, uh, of course, Peter carried about 70 pounds or mm -hmm. more. So Every day, it was the rigors, the physical endurance. It was the blisters. It was the heat. It was the cold. Peter and I, now this is really, I would not encourage anybody to start their marriage this way. <laughs> it was, it was uh, there was a lot of fatigue. We fought a lot. There was a lot of impatience, a lot of, uh, but but just just the endurance of all of it. So yes, I wanted to quit just about every day for three years. But then, you know, I think it's like anything. You you learn a certain rhythm. You get into a certain rhythm, a certain mindset, a certain uh, a, a certain understanding of, of, of what's happening. And I was more accepting as time went on. But it was difficult. It was hard. And yes, so many times I wanted to quit. In fact, let me tell you a story. We were in West Texas. We were staying on this ranch with an old couple named Homer and Ruby Martin. We had walked all day in the hot sun and they pulled up in this white pickup truck. And out West, this was before the internet. So the telephone lines out there buzzed with gossip about this young oh. couple walking across Texas. And of course we were in little newspapers. And so all the farmers and ranches, everybody had their eye out for us wanting to see where we were and where we were along the way. And of course they all thought we were total fools. Mm. Well, <clears throat> one day this white pickup truck pulled up, old couple named Homer and Ruby Martin. Did we want to drink a water? They had a big, 
thing of water on the back of their truck. Well, then they invited us to get in the truck and come home. They'd cook us a meal. So we went to their house and stayed a few days and rested. <clears throat> well, it was there that a big tornado happened to come. And th the skies were black and uh there were tornado warnings everywhere. And we knew Homer and Ruby, they had lived there their whole lives. So they knew exactly when we needed to head for the root cellar. Well, we watched that tornado from the porch and it came right up to the edge of their property. They were wheat farmers and cotton farmers. And then it veered off and started going north, but it tore up the land and tore up everything. But anyway, after that tornado passed by, Ruby and I were sitting on the front porch. You could smell the earth, how it had torn up the earth and just the fresh smell of dirt and sagebrush. And the stars started to twinkle and it was a black night and we were sitting there talking and she knew, she knew that this was hard for me. <clears throat> we had looked at a road map the day before. And, and when I saw we were just in Texas and I still had to walk all the way to Oregon, I, you could have blown me over with a feather. So Ruby knew she was, she was an old pioneer herself. And mm -hmm. so I started to, I didn't really complain, but I started to voice my concerns. And she said, Oh, la Barbara. She said, shoot, girl, this ain't nothing. You ain't lived till you've picked cotton all day long in the hot Texas sun, carrying 100 pounds for 25 cents, 100 pounds. Well, girl, you can do this. This ain't nothing. Well, it was people like Ruby. Just at my darkest moments mm -hmm. would come into my life and gave me the encouragement and the push and the undergirding that I needed to just keep going. Wow. Oh, I love that story. That's just one of so many more in the book. Yes. And then when you did finish the walk, you were on the cover of National Geographic. You, you and Peter just kind of blew up. You were on the radio. You were everywhere. How drastically did your life change after you completed the walk? After we ended the walk we we were kind of caught up in another tornado another whirlwind uh we had gone from sleeping on the ground and walking 15 miles a day to being jet set it all over the country to staying in the finest hotels um it was a drastic drastic change and of course i was pregnant with rebecca I gave birth to Rebecca the month we were on the cover of National Geographic. Mm -hmm. So our our whole world exploded. We became like the sweethearts of America. Mm -hmm. And of course, National Geographic, that catapulted even more fame, more interviews, more publicity. And out of that, we began writing bestsellers, um, the Walk West. The Walk West, um, Peter and I co-authored that and it became, I don't know, it became one of the most influential books on American culture in a hundred years. It's part mm -hmm. of the White House Library. It was a phenomenon. But then because of the fame and fortune, uh, we had money fell out of the sky. We bought a, a big, beautiful farm in Tennessee. We had two more children. So the family was growing. Opportunities were everywhere. But behind the scenes, my marriage was crumbling. Peter was gone 95, 96% of the time. And the temptations of wealth and money were just too much. And he... Uh, um, he broke the marriage vows many times. And that was, um, that was just more than I could bear. So our marriage fell apart 
And I had to basically start all over mm. and really, you know, um, I started all over as a single parent and it was very difficult because uh, Peter was the star. So it wasn't like I could just pick up and, and keep writing books and, and doing all this stuff. It, it just came to a screeching halt. So mm -hmm. my life changed dramatically and drastically, and it was reinventing myself once again, but I did. Yeah, you did. Do you think the fortitude that you that you showed during this walk, all of the miles and the blisters and the heat and everything, how did that inform your your reinvention of yourself? You're rising from the ashes. You're doing it on your own as a single mother. Was that part of it, or because you had already been through that, was it was it almost? I, I don't even want to say it was easy to go through that because you had already been through so much, but did it inform how you approached this new chapter of your life? I think it does. You know, life, all of life is made up of different seasons in your life. <clears throat> and growing up a poor hillbilly prepared me to walk across America. Walking across America and growing up a hillbilly prepared me to face that next season or next chapter of my life. I'd done without as a kid, I could do it again. Mm -hmm. I could find a way to make things work. And I, I also think walking across America taught me a very valuable lesson. That's my, can you hear my, my little clock chiming? Oh, a little bit. Okay. No, not really, you're good. <laughs> good. But I think walking across America taught me to take life one step at a time and one day at a time. And you have to, to preserve your energy, your sanity, your, your sense of where you are in life. And if I think this applies to everybody across the board, but we're so busy in this fast, high-tech virtual world that people have lost this ability to take one step at a time and to walk by faith and not by sight. Because I didn't know what each day would bring. Many times I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from. So that certainly prepared me the challenge was to do it with three children. Mm. And that was, that was my greatest, um, my greatest challenge. My greatest sorrow in life was that my children didn't grow up in an intact home, but those are their stories. And they've all grown to be uh, wonderful, productive human beings. My Rebecca, my daughter, has a master's degree and she has taught at the college level. She's now into uh, competing in, with horses. She's She loves horses. My oldest son, Jed, went on to get a law degree from Pepperdine and has written two New York Times bestselling books. Mm -hmm. And then my youngest son, Luke, uh, he is a, a business owner and has just, uh, they've just bought a beautiful log home out in the country. He, he's my outdoorsman. Well, Jed is too. So anyway, uh, I think all of those things in my past prepared me to face each day, but each day is a gift and each day has its challenges, but uh, don't panic. Just take one step at a time. Mm. Well, we could, we could end it right there. That's so beautifully said, but <laughs> <laughs> to to the mother listening who's tuning into this, um, just to round out the interview, what do you want her to know about your life, the book, or anything that we've talked about? What's something you want her to remember from this talk? I want young mothers to know that you have a destiny and that you are equipped with whatever you need to, like I said, take it 
one step, one day at a time. And to know that you, just like me, I, I believe I have fulfilled my destiny and I still have more to go. I don't regret anything in my life. And I want you to know that you have a destiny and that you too are the apple of God's eye. Wow. 